When a couple prominent people came out vocally against me, I remember like when I read, the, I remember where I was and I remember how I felt when I read that and it was like, it was like devastating to me. give it all I got. What's up? Welcome to another episode of Embrace the Grind. I have a very special guest with me today, someone that I've been friends with for multiple years here in Las Vegas, running in the same poker circles. She's made quite a name for herself in the last couple of years. We're going to get into all that, but I just want to say welcome to the show, Marley. Thank you for taking some time with me today. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right. So for those of you that don't know, Marley has uh, been playing poker for quite a long time also has been making content for the last couple of years. And one thing that I find really interesting about your story, your more recent story is just your meteoric rise. Because when I first met you, you were more of a, a low stakes player. You were taking the game serious, um, but you were playing uh, the one threes and the two fives and things like that. And just through, I mean, I don't even know how what to call it. You just through grit, determination, networking, putting yourself out there through content, you've been able to elevate to games that I, I mean, I've never touched only never even sniffed that I could only dream of and um, had some wild swings. Well, I kind of want to touch on a little bit too, because um, a lot of people that are watching, you know, they, they are in those streets of the small stakes and uh, yep. every, we all have these dreams of uh, elevating to the levels where we can play. You know, I, I think I've heard that you've played 300, 600. I'm sure that there's been straddles and things like that. Games where you buy in 50,000, 100,000. Yeah. And like for, for someone who has um, been kind of a small stakes grinder to making it to that place, like, mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to, we're going to back up a little bit, but I'm just curious, like, did you ever really think that you would get there or did it happen so fast? Was it a whirlwind? It was a complete whirlwind. Um, my journey was, in general, not just poker-wise, uh, a total whirlwind um, because of how fast it happened. But no, I didn't think I would get there. And I wanted to say, too, I think when we first met, I actually was a waitress because I've known you for probably five years. And I think when we first, first met, I was just waiting tables. I wasn't even playing poker. So, you know, you've kind of seen the whole genesis to the... Yeah, but even though you were waiting tables, I, I knew that you had an interest in poker. Yeah, I played and, recreational. For and sure. uh, a lot of people that even, you know, I, I didn't know you were a waitress at the time when I met you, but I just assumed that you were grinding out the small stakes. You know, you lived with a bunch of my friends who were yeah. taking poker very serious. And I knew that if you were living in that kind of environment, that it would be impossible for you to not either be taking the game serious or to at least be winning on some level in the smaller stakes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I remember seeing you around in the smaller stakes and had a couple games around town. I remember you would show up for and you're always really fun at the table and just like <laughs> one I, word for it. <laughs> yeah, you were you're always giving people the business. That's like a British term. I, yeah, yeah, I learned yeah. that one recently, the business. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, and uh, and you were uh, you were always like pretty good, you know. And I think Thank that's you. one of the things that people underestimate about um, about your game is they, they see like the things that you put on out in content and they, they don't think that you've like worked for it or they don't think that you've like quote unquote earned it or, or they don't think you're even good. And I think that that's absolutely ridiculous. So I'm here to set the record straight. Oh. Marley has been putting in the work for quite a long time. I've known her in these circles and she's aligned herself with some really great poker people. Um, but I want to I want to re rewind to w w your first interest in even poker. Mm -hmm. I know you said your dad had been playing and, and was uh, playing as his primary source of income for some time. Yeah. And uh, you lived in Vegas. And mm -hmm. when you you lived in Vegas during your high school years, I went to freshman year here. Yeah. Uh, OK. What What is it like as a as a young person in Vegas? Well, it was really uh, jarring for me because I grew, I grew up predominantly in a super small town in Massachusetts, 80 people in my graduating class. And then I came to Vegas and I went to school in Spring Valley, Spring Valley High School, um, which is a, you know, it's a big school, but it's one of the smaller ones, Vegas standards. But yeah, I think from what I saw, like the kids just lived fast. I think drugs were like much more prevalent. Just mm -hmm. kids would be going to the strip, hanging out by the strip, hanging out by the pool, hanging out. Um, 
And even at the school, like there's all kinds of like flashy cards, like Ferraris and Lamborghinis. And, you know, my dad was playing poker full time and he played full time in Boston. And it was a much different reaction when you told him my dad plays poker for a living here. It was like, no, no big deal. Like didn't even phase people. Whereas in where I was from, it was like, what? What even is that? Yeah, it's definitely. Just, yeah. Um, so you were a little bit younger, so freshman year. Mm -hmm. But I imagine that there was probably girls in your high school that were like, you know, 16, 17 years old that were like having boyfriends that were like buying them Maseratis and things like that. Like, yeah. th like it's kind of like the, the New York sugar baby kind of thing, like in Vegas as well. So I would think that a pretty girl, luckily you left after your freshman year, but I could see a pretty girl in Vegas, uh, going down that path of um the easy money and like getting involved in some crazy things at a young age in las vegas do you uh do you did you have a good time in vegas or were you happy to go back to boston um frankly i was happy to go back i i of course i had missed i had made my like life long friends which i had to leave you know when i came here and so i was happy to go back to see them i was only here for about a year mm -hmm. um and my dad ended up going broke, which is why we went back and, and he was struggling the whole time. It was like the, you know, probably the lowest point in his, we actually went home and moved in with my grandparents. So he was super busto and just struggling. You know, he did win a small tournament while we were here and that was a really big highlight. He took me to the uh, Dior store in Bellagio and said, pick something out and he won. That's he amazing. won 20K. That's amazing. And so he bought me, I still have the bag and he, uh, and so we had, you know, and, and the thing with that was he always treated me. He always, like, even though I was like super young, like 13, 14, he would level with me. He would tell me when he lost. He would tell me Hannah's stories. He would tell me how it was going, what it was like, the friends he had. I knew the, what, what happened. So I was just like very involved and it, it was a lot it was a lot at that age for sure did you were you taking an interest in the game at that point or because your dad was or, or was it more of that you were um worried or or felt like it wasn't like a great thing because of seeing him go broke i definitely uh got turned off by that by mm -hmm. watching that uh, at the time i was really getting into like modeling i did my first shoot here and so that was like my dream it was like i want to be a model i want to like be supermodel. And so I wasn't really focused on poker, especially watching what it did to him at the time. So, and I think forever, I've just always had that bad taste in my mouth about what this game can do for yeah. sure. Uh, so your first taste of modeling was in Vegas? Yeah, I did a shoot. I did a test shoot here to like make a comp card to try to get an agent basically. And that was right before we left. And then we got went home to Boston. He took me to the city, and I got signed to an agent in Boston, and ended up working oh, there. Wow. Yeah, nice. So throughout high school, yeah. What uh, what was it like um, being a model in high school? I feel like like girls are catty, and like was that like a part of? Um, I don't know. Was that like a part of? Was that was that tough? Would, were you like into sports? Was it like kind of your thing that you did? You were you ostracized from the people at school, or was it? Yeah, I, I definitely had a hard time in school. I had a couple really close friends and I didn't have a lot of friends. I wasn't popular. And especially when I was living with my grandparents was when this was all happening. We were living at my grandparents and this wasn't the town I grew up in. This was another new school. And, you know, it, kids can be like really cruel too. And so they knew that I was living, they knew like at this point that I lived with my grandparents and my dad was broke and whatever. And I have this really sweet story of uh, during this time where it was sweet in hindsight, but I hate myself for it. But my dad, when he went broke, he, this was during the recession and he couldn't get a job. And he finally got a job driving an airport limo. And it was like a big deal for us that he <laughs> was like driving an airport limo. And I was going to this dance and he, uh, he got one of the limos to like take me to the dance and he like surprised me or whatever. And I was like so like embarrassed by it. I was like, dad, like they already, they already, I don't want them to know this is what you do or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And, but in hindsight, like it's just so like sweet. My dad's such a sweetheart. And I remember like another time, he didn't have a car, we didn't have a car. And he walked to my school to like a parent teacher conference. And mm. just like remember him like, like he like well, literally walked there like a couple miles. And it was so sweet and like, and that time was just so, uh, 
I don't know. It was just so precious to me. Yeah, I think it's interesting that a lot of times we look back at the things that were, you know, tribulations are, are hard for us as like fond memories. Yeah. And I, I yeah. do that. I do that with poker, too. Like some of the most difficult times where I'm playing low stakes at the beginning of my career and I, I you know, lose a large percentage of my money. I think back to those times and I'm like, that was actually kind of fun, you know, like poker was different back then. And yeah, like, yeah. it was all this excitement of like, I don't know, nostalgia. There's something about nostalgia it, when it's like tr pain or trouble that I've always looked back on a, as like either a rite of passage or just something that I look back fondly on, which is, which is really interesting to me. So these, these moments that you've had with your dad where they were difficult, you know, where he was walking to your parent-teacher conferences, where you were embarrassed by him driving a limo. I love that you have the perspective now to look back at it as like, you know, fond memories because like that was your dad like being super like a great dad. So I love hearing that story. These are stories that I haven't heard. Yeah. Um, so you, you were in, uh, after, after high school, um, you were still doing the modeling thing for a little while? Yeah, so I was I did really well with it in high school, and I literally thought like I'm gonna be a supermodel. This is like my calling. I'm just I don't want to go to school. I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna become this like supermodel. And my agent, bless his heart, in Boston, called me up and was like, you know, with respect, you should go to school. You know, um, I was gonna go to New York and get an agent there, and he was like, you know, you're good, but like you're short and you've got these problems and so much of that industry is so superficial yeah. and, and it's whatever. crazy to say you have these problems i'm sure it's like the most minor of things it's like you have this like dimple or you sure. you're like two inches too short it's just yes. insane that like these problems are are so magnified and something as competitive as modeling in new york city um but you yeah. you made some i'm sure you made good money for for a teenager i did yeah some of the checks you probably got were like Wow, that's why why you thought you were going to be a supermodel. Yeah, I mean, I bought myself a car. Well, it was funny because this was all starting to happen when my dad was broke. Mm. So I was making all this money and he was broke. Oh, wow. I had more money than him. It was crazy. And he never took a dime, obviously. I just would save it all. I bought myself a car. So basically what happened was we lived with my grandparents for a year. He drove the limo and then he got a real job. Um, he does SEO. Mm. Uh, so he got a real job doing that. And we ended up moving back to my original town and I graduated there um so by the time I was making like good money he was back on his feet but you know um yeah I made good money in high school and I moved to New York and I went to school and I got an agent there but it beca it became clear pretty quickly that like this wasn't going to be a career yeah. were there like a lot of like you going to casting calls and then being like no sorry it's just like, yeah, I think Boston is just more small town. Mm. Even though it's a big city, it's just they're much they're much more um, gentle too. Mm. I, I went to New York actually to meet with agents in high school at one point and they like put me on a scale in the office wow. in front of the whole office and things like that that are like really jarring to like a 15 or 16 year old girl. Yeah, that's absolutely insane. So yeah, and so I got a taste of that and so, uh, how I got into acting is I started to do more commercials and stuff. Mm, I've um, seen some of those acting reels. I think oh. they're really actually <laughs> Thank good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Presenting the limited edition Trooper from Azuzu. Practically amazing. I like them a lot, which I mean, it's no surprise that you, you know, I've done, you've done modeling, you've done acting, um, you've done comedy as well, right? Yeah, when I was acting, I did some stand-up, yeah. Um, that seems terrifying, by the way. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> um, so, you di so did you do like open mic nights where it was like you would show up and your friends would be like, come on, go up there and, you know, do it? Well, my first time was uh, I was in an acting class and my teacher, uh, shout out to Anthony Abison, who uh, was like my biggest fan and he told me, you're funny, you're going to do stand-up. It was like an assignment he gave me. And they have these things called bringer shows where basically anybody can do them. You have to bring 15 people who buy two drinks, basically. And he's like, you're going to do a bringer show. I did it at Gotham. And my whole class went as like the, oh, wow. the you know what I mean? Yeah. The support. And so I did that bringer show. And of course, I bombed and just was <laughs> drunk and just. Even with your 15 friends, I feel like 15 <laughs> friends can be supportive and laugh at anything. It's so hard. It's so, it's, you're just naked. It's yeah. you and 
yeah. and what you prepared within a mic. That's it. Yeah, that's naked. that's that's really interesting. And uh, yeah. one of the reasons why, I mean, <laughs> I can't picture myself doing it honestly because it sounds so scary. But I think that there's probably a ton of growth in that, like being up there and just having to like figure figure your way out with this. I mean, even with this, like yeah. if something goes wrong or I was gonna say I can just like cut it, you know, and change the camera angle and you guys won't even know, you know? So I was gonna say like so much of it though, we think that we can't do these things, but then so much of it is you're there and you just you have to like rise to the occasion. Even you with the vlogs or the podcasting or poker or whatever, it's like when you're just there and you have to figure it out, you figure it out. Yeah, That's I've noticed that um when I've done podcasts where it's a where it's a live stream, for some reason, like I always just come through. Like I always just figure it out and conversations always seamless, never really any problems. Mm -hmm. It's when I have the backup plan of like, oh, I could just cut the camera angle or if something goes wrong, it's gonna be okay. And yeah. those are the moments that I'm more willing to like freeze up in, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's something to the human element of um, having your back against the wall and just like having to figure it out. Yeah. So did you ever reach a point in comedy where you were like, you were getting the laughs and you were like, man, I think I could do this. Like people are really, I, I could be the next, I don't know, who, give me a female comedian. I don't know, Whitney Cummings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I could be the next yeah. one I heard. Did you ever feel like you could go down that path? Um, no, I mean, I, I have to admit, I've always had this thing with the acting Hollywood world and especially comedians where I always kind of felt like I don't belong here. I just always kind of felt like I can't intense imposter syndrome where frankly like i i didn't really have that in poker the yeah. minute i came to poker i was like i can do this i think it's somewhat because it's a little bit degenerate the people in it even the people who are successful are a little bit edgy and like yeah rough around the edges whereas especially in a place like new york my ex was a director i kind of ran in some circles with you know elitist hollywood people um and I always kind of felt like I'm kind of a scumbag. I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't deserve to be here. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think that poker is a kind of an interesting thing where it's really male dominated. And I think that, um, there's no, there's no secret why it's male dominated. I mean, one of the reasons is, you know, the risk averse, the, the, the willing to be degenerate, like you mentioned, yeah. um, the competitive nature of it. I feel like it just lends itself this is not a hot take by the way no. <laughs> <laughs> i feel like it just lends itself to <clears throat> it shouldn't be i think it kind of is unfortunately yeah i and i mean you're the queen of hot takes so you maybe you could help me with this one but no i think you're right I well mean, no, the other day i i mentioned in uh in one of my videos that a player sat down at the table and he was eastern european mm -hmm. and that um you know i just felt like with his energy that he was gonna be a good player. I mentioned that in my vlog. And uh, somebody wrote on my channel saying that if they saw me, they would beat the F out of me because that's uh, derogatory because um, I wouldn't call someone from uh, Portugal Western European, would I? And, <laughs> and now that I'm calling them Eastern European, it's like, you know, this negative thing. And I, I was clueless, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like, I'm like, I did not know that, you know, my wife's Eastern European. So yeah. like, <laughs> I, I was just absolutely clueless. Um, and uh, for a moment, I'm like, should I just like, write? I, I'm sorry about that, you know, but I'm like, I, I have to go back to like intent, you know, I don't think that my intent was, um, and, and I think that the broad spectrum of the world kind of is on my side with this one and thinking that like this is not something that's so it's really difficult and I know that you've struggled with this as well on figuring out um, when you've gone too far when you need to apologize when the take was actually way too hot um, and I, I well I'm, I'm skipping out a bu around a bunch here but um, you did a uh, you did a video that really just kind of exploded you onto the scene which was uh, finding a, a poker boyfriend yeah um, and I thought it was absolutely genius. Oh, I was you. like, <laughs> I just love that video so much. Uh, I, for me personally, as a poker content creator, I really get uh, excited about the stuff that's creative, ab about the stuff that um, you know, just the random poker player isn't able to make. That's why we were watching uh, Matt Kiefer's video where yeah, he we were did. Just watching it, yeah. Matt Kiefer did a poker out loud rounder spoof. He's done a, a rounder spoof of myself. 
these kind of things I, I just, uh, I find so interesting. And I've even tried to do it before. Um, I had a fan interaction that was a spoof. Mm -hmm. And everybody absolutely hated it. They said it was awful. Is this the one with Doug? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think it was awful. I just think people are. Yeah. I will say this. This is what happens too on YouTube is when you are a certain way or they know you a certain way, when you step out of that, even if it's good, you're going to get that pushback. You're going to get that polarization. People know you for what you do. And when you... And it's just the the nature of the beast. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I remember... Uh, I mean... I wasn't really in the comments, but uh, your feedback from that was like largely positive, right? It was yeah. totally, yeah. It was largely positive for sure. But the the there was some vocal um, not, feedback that was like, yeah, uh, this is like derogatory towards women or things like that. Um, and you at one point made an apology video about it. Yeah, I mean, well, like I said before. I went to from zero to 60 with my public presence, I think quicker than most people. This was um, maybe vlog six. And it was, I remember when, I don't want to name names, but when a couple prominent people came out vocally against me, I remember like when I read, the, I remember where I was and I remember how I felt um, when I read that. And it was like, it was like devastating to me. It was devastating to me. It was... I really took it to heart. I really felt misunderstood. I really felt like that's not my intention, whatever. And I made this video explaining myself being like, I'm, I'm an ally. I'm just yeah. being self-deprecating, whatever. None of those people have ever reached out to me or accepted that or hmm. nothing ever happened from that. And so I just kind of said, you know what, whatever. And I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but this, this, uh, relationship to criticism and and the audience in this way has been something I've really like struggled with my method and even to this day I'm still like figuring it out but it's just hard I mean it yeah. was um it's do, you, just really hard. do you remember how long um when when you actually read the comments do you remember how long it took you to type back was it like measured? Were you, did you wait like a couple hours? Did you immediately just pick up your phone and start typing? Was it something that you thought on for a little while? I can't, I don't, I don't think I, I didn't message them, mm. but I was t texting friends like uh, furiously and people I knew in poker that were, f were friends like yeah. on the phone, like furiously, like yeah. having a convulsion. I, I remember, um, you know, cause we, we had a similar thing. My seventh video is the one that like really took off. Um, having like, you know, no views to a hundred thousand views was like insane. Yeah. And, um, so mine was a little different in that I was, I'm not controversial. You know, I just kind of just talk about poker. I don't talk about anything really outside of poker. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about my life, but, um, definitely don't go down politics, religion, anything, sure. any, anything like that. And, um, so my feedback was just always so positive and, and it, it had been like, you know, thank you for your videos for like at least a year, maybe a year and a half. And then I remember the day that I had someone public say that I was like a bad person publicly. And I was, I remember exactly where I was too. I was DJing my wife's yoga class and like I'm mid song and I see all these notifications popping up. So I look and like, I immediately started texting. I, I immediately started responding on Twitter. Like, right. like you're wrong. F you like and, and like I was just not prepared to handle criticism because I had just never gone through it before as someone that's, you know, a elder millennial, not really growing up with social media to, you know, having no social footprint, having a lot of people follow me within a year, yeah. then all of a sudden people hating me. I just was like not ready for it. So I could see, you know, from being on this side of it, how, uh, um, you know, that can, that can be difficult for, for someone to navigate. Um, no one, I mean, they don't, no one's prepared for it. We're not, yeah. you know, and I, people mean well when they say, don't listen to them. They're just idiots. Don't listen to them. But like, we are only human. Yeah. No one's prepared for being anonymous to just having bunches of people have hot takes on you and tell you to your face. Yeah. Or, I, ju you know? I just had this epiphany. <clears throat> while while talking through this 
Um, it feels like the more you care about your audience, the more I care about my audience, mm -hmm. the more I care about the criticism. You know, so like when people are um, coming up to me and saying, I love your videos, that part I take in and I like, I really feel that and I, I'm like, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I can't really have that if I'm not like upset when the people are like, oh, I hate your videos. Yeah, you're invested. Yeah, so I, I feel like the secret is in some way to detach a little bit and, and yeah. like not really care about the, the, the praises along with not caring about the criticism as much. I haven't figured it out to this day and I'm still navigating it. Well, this is something I'm, I'm in, I've actually been in therapy and I talk about this stuff a lot. And I think a key to that is, is ego death in a way where it's like the reason why I think we all like the praise is because it loves our ego. Because on some level, we have that question in our mind, are we doing good work? Is it appreciated? Am I liked? And every time you get that jolt of, validation or jolt of whatever you're feeding the beast but then you don't get it or you have the negative you wake the beast and if it can just be i, I don't i don't do this by the way i just you know this is my goal <laughs> this is just a distant dream but like uh if it can just be that i do this work because i genuinely enjoy it if no one watched it i'd be totally fine then you're that's gold yeah, for that's, sure. That's the dream. There's definitely that uh, that uh, ar like argument within myself on if I I make the videos that I want and nobody watched it and it, I would be fine with it. I struggle with that because I know what the audience wants, and yeah. I I can just give them what they want and they'll reward me by like liking the videos and sharing it and commenting and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, but at some point I feel like. It's not creatively challenging me to do those things. I know we've had these conversations early on when you first started making videos. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, they only want me to talk about hands. And, and I remember giving you the advice that's easier said than like actually executing on the advice. Just do what you want. Because like, I don't always just do what I want either. Like they want the hands, I give them the hands sometimes. So something that I've definitely battled with before. And like, like you, I'm just like, I thought that, I was, you know, pretty socially well adjusted, pretty well evolved, pretty zen. Mm -hmm. And then these things that come up, like in poker, you know, when yeah. when things when the tribulations come up, you you actually get to learn like how actually zen I, I really am. And I guess I need a lot more work to go. I mean, and this is but this is the thing for me is that I'm in a pos I I genuinely feel like doing the work of what we're talking about because this obviously applies to life too, right? And and I'm my, more micro sense but because i'm at the point now where i care so much about building my brand building this project doing good work i want that to be so good that's what's driving me to do the work on myself i guess in a way mm -hmm. it's kind of sad that like i'm not capable of just doing that for just the good of my own self but in a way it's like you know, when the light's like shining on you and you're in the spotlight, it's kind of when we said like you step up to the plate mm -hmm. and that's kind of what it forces me yeah. to do. I like, love that you're so open about um, therapy. You're so open about yeah. your personal life because I feel like uh, a lot of people will look at you or, or someone who has a, a lot of social media influence and just think that, oh, I can just say whatever to them. They're not a real person. Like, and, and you, you're like, no, actually that that feedback that i got i had to go to therapy about that we're talking about it like we're working through it not a lot of people do that i love that you do that yeah uh yeah for sure. yeah um so i've definitely been skipping around so we, we left off in uh, new york and kind of realized that your uh, modeling supermodel career wasn't gonna quite work out the way that you thought it was shocker uh, uh, shocker and uh <laughs> um and you know dabbling in acting and uh yeah. also dabbling in uh, comedy. Um, did you, did you finish school or did you? No, I did two years. Oh, okay. Um, and I dropped out to go to two acting schools. So oh, okay. I went to two acting schools for two years after two years in university. Um, and did that while I was auditioning and doing all that stuff. And it was just hard. I was, you know, I was 21, 22, and it's just a grind. It's like a complete rat race. There's something about the vibe in in um, in New York where 
it's it's a great city because it you wake up hungry, you wake up and you just like want to go 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 grind mm. grind grind. But at that age, like I was just so like lost. Yeah. Just, what what was the catalyst for shaking it up and leaving New York? And where did you go after that? So I came to Vegas. My dad uh, at the time had moved back here when I went to school. He was working from home and doing well. But he's, you know, in snowy Boston. He was like, mm-hmm. I got to get out of here. I work from home anyways. So, you know, he loves Vegas. He yeah. loves, he loves, um, he still loves poker for fun and all that. So he was here and uh, my mom actually passed away un- uh, unexpectedly, which, well, I woke up with my boyfriend. We were very serious living together and everything, staying on my friend's couch because we lived in his place. And then she passed like a week later. So it was mm-hmm. a really, uh, brutal time yeah but frankly i've talked about this before uh i was already like kind of at my end that was mm-hmm. kind of just the, the straw that broke the camel's back in a way yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, I've heard you mention this before but it feels like um huge like life events like this have been the catalyst for just kind of like course different course career and things like that coming yeah. to vegas uh did you immediately pick up poker when you got back well i actually went back and forth for probably almost a year um I still had a lot of friends there, and I would just, I would come here, stay with my dad, obviously, and I always like played recreationally because, you know, my dad played, yeah. and of course I made friends here because I was just playing poker. So I had some friends here, I had some friends there, and I would go back and forth, and and still like I would audition a little bit, but I like wasn't taking it seriously. Obviously, I was mm-hmm. just off the rails, like of course just partying a lot, drinking a lot. Um, and then I got to the point where I was like, okay, I need to just be in Vegas. And I came here and I got a job waiting tables, um, a good job. And I had met some like British kids playing poker. And so I lived with them, um, at Meridian and yeah, I mean, I guess I, I did, I did kind of want to, to play at the time because I just like hated working. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like really hard to work a shitty job when you see everyone around you mm-hmm. living this like free freedom lifestyle. So I did kind of want to play, but it wasn't until I met my ex-boyfriend till I really was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Uh, getting caught in that um, service industry as a, as a pretty girl in Vegas, it, you can definitely go down like one or two paths. You can, you know, take the path that you did and exit that, or yeah. you can like, next is like the bottle girl job where they're like making thousands of dollars and i i I see a lot of women go that way um so diving into poker again with like a very serious um you know dedication to the game happened Mm -hmm. because of these british guys no i mean they're they they definitely like got my you know piqued my interest Mm. with just like just living with them and seeing their lifestyle of course poker is just like it's so uh i did still know the downsides because Mm. of my dad but i just it's really hard to work a nine to five or a shitty waitressing job when you see everyone around you just living this life so it piqued my interest then i met my ex and um he and all his friends were playing full time and even more so it was just you know and my job was you know yeah. Even even less money and just. Do you remember the day that you quit? Like, what was was there a catalyst? Or you're like, you know what? Today's the day that I'm gonna try this poker thing out. Yeah. Um. I don't remember like the actual moment where I was like, I'm done. But I do remember that like the restaurants actually closed now. Actually, they actually mm. closed down probably three four months after I quit. So oh, wow. it would have come to an end any, naturally, but. It was just, um, it had been really slow. I just was making like no money. Mm-hmm. And um, did, did you yeah. immediately uh, go on to a stake or did you start playing with your own money? A stake, because I didn't really have much money. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, um, like I said, it had been slow for a while and I wasn't, you know, so I went on a stake. Uh, one of my ex's friends staked me. He was like starting a stable at the time, so, or a stable ish Mm -hmm. he staked like three four people and he um took me on and you know i really uh i've talked about him a lot in podcasts but he like really is responsible i don't think i'd be here without him yeah i'm I'm friends with him and i think he's a really great guy and um 
I like him a lot. And I, I think he's got a good poker mind too. So yeah. it's really great to really great to align yourself with someone like that. And um, you mostly were in the one three and two five area. Well, that's the thing is he was so hard on me in a good way where I remember like I just like wanted to play two five. I was like, oh, I can just play two five. And he was like, no, no, no. I started playing, um, well, actually where I really took off was the one, two game in Golden Nugget. Mm. He made me play one, two, and then one, three for 300. And then I moved up to one, three at the win, 500, and then Bellagio two, five, and then Aria two, five. But I had to make X amount over a certain sample size. And like, Mm. I had to like earn each incremental jump. And he was really like strict about it. Nice. And so few people have had that experience, you know, there are poker players who play 5-10 now who've never played 1-3. That's insane to me. It, it's more common than you think, or they've never looked at preflop charts. Wow. And that's something he made me memorize, like upswing um, yeah. preflop charts and, you know, just send him. I mean, the thing about him, though, is he uh, he was kind of like hands-off where he was like, he would never hit me up mm-hmm. to ask me about shit. Mm-hmm. But if I ever messaged him, he was like right on it mm-hmm. and happy to no matter how stupid the question. And that's what I always tell people is like, I was so hungry. I wanted it so bad. I would just like constantly ask him questions, stupid questions. That's, I think that's like the key. That's the secret that a lot of people just don't get. I mean, it's like any job. Like if you're going to succeed in any job, you're, you're going to be the one that's like there early asking questions, bugging your boss and things like that. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, that makes sense that your, you, uh, your trajectory in poker was, measured and uh and sounds like um really uh smart in the way that you moved up and um eventually it was like forced discipline though i wouldn't have done it yeah if i i'm just so lucky i hear so many horror stories now but like bad staking deals or a mm. lot of stakers they just like don't they want to be silent they don't want to help they don't want to coach they kind of yeah. just want to give you money and yeah it, it's like it's like with anything. So if if I went to work at X Y Z Amazon and I never saw my boss ever, yeah, I would be wondering like, does my boss even like care what I'm doing? And it's the same thing with poker. Like yeah. I I've staked many people in my career, and the ones that have done the best are the ones that have reached out to me constantly, and like I could tell really wanted it because I'm not the best about like being a manager and being a boss, you know, like I, I kind of need that 50, 50 relationship from them to like be reaching out to me all the time. So it, I imagine that like, that was a big part of your success is just like really loving the game and, and really diving in and wanting to like move up. Yeah. I will say too, I just kind of knew that I had to like make it work. I, d- mm-hmm. I couldn't have my, my ex was staked by him at the time and he had gone broke m- many times. He had been struggling and because, uh, you know, he was like, I don't know if it's because he was one of the guys or he had that deeper friendship, but like he had so many second chances and whether or not it's true in my mind, I was like, I have one chance. If yeah. I go bust or this doesn't work, like I'm, I'm screwed here. Yeah. Definitely. I have to make it work. When, uh, when did you start thinking about making content? Um, it was actually a year before I actually made it. So oh, wow. for a long time I bought a camera and was... I filmed a bunch of, bunch of stuff and I'm sure you had the same experience where I just the first 10 things I filmed were like unusable. Yeah. So cringe. So, and this is somebody I've been in front of the camera, but still so cringe. It's, yeah, it's definitely. so hard. Yeah. I had that. Ex- I mean, I had that same experience. Luckily I didn't think that anybody was going to watch it. So yeah. I was like, I'll just put this up and nobody will watch it anyways. And I committed to doing 10 videos. So I'm going to stick to the plan of doing 10 videos. And if nobody would watch those 10 videos, I probably would have quit after that. Yeah. Because I was kind of like, I kind of like set a goal. Like this is my 10 videos. I'll make them in 10 weeks. But then on the seventh video, people started watching. And then I'm like, okay, I want to get better at this. So I just like started diving into like, oh, how do I do camera angles and composition and my audio and like all this crazy stuff. And I I put the same passion and energy into learning how to work cameras and how to edit and do all those things that Mm -hmm. I did with like my poker game, which which I think is one of the reasons why, you know, you guys are watching this in 4K with decent audio. (laughs) Hi. Oh, I know someone's here. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, this is uh, somebody that I'm staking, actually. His, Hello. His, 
<laughs> His name is Edgar. This is Marley. I'm sure I'll see you around in the live games. <laughs> Take care, bud. Good luck. Thanks. I hope he was paying attention to the part where he should be reaching out to me <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I we've only been working together for about two weeks now. Okay. But he's been on my radar for like three years. Uh-huh. And that's just, people re- always are like, how do I get staked? How do I get coached? And things like that. Like, it's not an accident that I've, he's been on my radar for three years. He was like somebody that I met through one of the meetup games yeah. who then started like, you know, reaching out about hand histories and like not overwhelmingly, but just always supporting everything. Every time I release a hoodie, bought it. Every time I do anything in the, in the uh, live stream chat in there, you know, and, and like I started paying attention, like, man, this guy is really supporting me. Yeah. And then I would like talk to him about poker a little bit. I'm like, oh, this guy is talent, you know? So then it was like one of those natural things where I was like, I want to get this place in Vegas. I need to find someone. He's a kid. He's, you know, 23 years old yeah. at the point of in his life where he can just pick up and come to Vegas. It doesn't happen because like you filled out a resume and it's the first time that you've ever crossed paths with me. You know how many times people have reached out to me on Twitter, asked me a question and then I click on them. They don't even follow me. I'm like, how, how am I supposed to just give you all of my time and all the stuff yeah. if like you haven't been supporting me? All right, when I, I went on a tangent there. But, no, yeah, but it's true. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, I, before we get into the con, oh, so the content was kind of the catalyst for you being able to like go really high stakes though. Yeah, I mean, my vlog changed my life as I'm sure yours. But for me, my quick And the brief version is that I broke up with my ex after in the last year of us being together, me toying around with this idea of starting the vlog. And, um, you know, I think, again, when you're at that low point and when you're at that, um, you kind of feel like you have nothing to lose. Because sometimes I feel like when I'm just so low, I just I just do my best work because you just have literally nothing to lose. And so I just threw it up there. I just filmed it. And it was like almost, once I started, I didn't second guess anything and was just kind of like, I just kind of knew. And and yeah, things happened like pretty quickly. I just, overnight, everything like started traveling to play tournaments and Mm -hmm. do commentary and, you know, uh, obviously the big game and. I remember the the Triton that you you flew to do. Um, I love how you were so transparent on your social media about how like, I've never done this before and this is scary and all these things and you were showing bloopers and things like that. <laughs> I was I, so bad. I love that you do that. It, uh, hosting tournament, hosting is the hardest job I've ever had. I think actually I think harder than stand up because I think a little, it's a hard job, but particularly with my personality, you have to like hunt people down on breaks. Mm. They don't want to talk to you. Yeah. You know. It's it, just, yeah, it's different because the rapport of a, of that is like you're trying to extract things from them versus having it be a casual conversation so when you're met with like one word answers or dead silence it's like how do i get out of this (laughs) well and also well bless his heart so stapes um actually was the one that kind of got me that job and he had told me that my i when i did montenegro he's like you know just know that you're in a really tough spot here because typically you'd have a producer, which is, I had a producer in the second try-in, which it's night and day because they literally tell you, okay, we're going to get this person on break. Here's, just go over some questions. I feel like this, this, and this is a good topic. They literally almost like spell it out for you and like set you up. My first try-in, it was, I had none of that. They were literally were like, okay, like we're on break, like get somebody just, and then like, just talk. You're the producer. Yeah. Or just literally just talk. Yeah. Like you make it up. You need to direct the conversation. That That's essentially producing. You know? Yeah, just like everything thick on your feet. Yeah, I, but at the same token, like you're, you're a good producer. Like the, the videos that you've made and like the, the, the topics and the way that you present them and the comedy that you inject Thank into you. them, that's not really like something that other people in the poker industry are doing. So there's no surprise that, you know, you took off, obviously. Um, I, I personally watch and enjoy, and I don't watch a lot of poker content, so I, I will say Thank that. <laughs> um, so after you, uh, started, I kind of want to know about some of these big games cause you know, it's something that I've never played in. And, yeah. um, I personally, you know, I've, I've dealt with, you know, losing 20,000 in a day and things like that. But 
Um, and those are like soul crushing for me, mm-hmm. you know, um, I can't imagine some of the amounts that you've dealt with and have you, uh, felt like you've been able to detach from the money or do you feel like it's just something that you're always going to struggle with? I've gotten better, but I definitely just was, I mean, you can't detach. I, I'm not a robot, you know, mm. the first six months, especially playing that big, like, again, there's a reason why my ex backer made me make incremental jumps because when you go inc- incrementally, you know, it's like a, you dip your toe in the pool and then I just dove off the deep end. And so I definitely punted off a lot. I definitely lean aggro when I'm uncomfortable in environments. So I was just playing crazy. And, and also I, my trajectory, uh, you know, profit wise has been, I would buy in for like 50 K. So I was down 200, 250 K literally three or four times. And then as soon as I would be out, I would like completely punt it off. Wow. And it was just like this mental thing. I did that like literally three or four times and it's just like f- only five buy-ins. So mm-hmm. like I'd be down a little bit and get out in a session or two. And then right when I was like going to make money, I would like completely like, t- mm. like punt it off. And I think it was, um, because I had half of myself. Right. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. to make even one buy-in 50 K 25 K right in your pocket is just like, yeah. There's so much pressure. For sure. It's just crazy. Yeah. Um, do you see yourself continuing to play in those games or do you feel like you're built for it? Like you can you can navigate that? Um, frankly, I, I'm i leaning uh, away from it just because I'm leaning more into content. I'm, yeah. I'm moving away from Vegas. I would not really like to get buried in makeup. Yeah. Right? Or like you only get into makeup and then leave Vegas. So... And another reason why is because um, the these games are the game that I was playing was still in a casino, mm-hmm. even though it was private. And those games are now moving private into like houses into super private. And obviously, what comes with that is a there's a lot of things for you know? sure. Yeah, no, definitely. So. Um, and speaking of leaving Vegas, you found a poker boyfriend. Yes, I found a book of fiance. Uh, yes. Fiance, congratulations. That was you said that was video number six? Yeah. You, you spoke you spoke it into existence. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um yeah. so congratulations on that. And you're planning on spending a lot more time in the UK. His yeah. Um his name is Benjamin Sprague, right? Sprague, yeah. Um, everybody calls him Spraggy, so I wasn't sure if it was Benjamin Spraggy. Yeah, yeah everyone thinks it's yeah. <laughs> um yeah. but he um he's a poker stars team pro. And um, seems to have quite an influence on your life because you've been playing tournaments lately. Yes. <laughs> and this is, you know, everyone is my arch nemesis in the world is tournaments. I hate them. I always have. It's, you know, a little bit because I just do so bad in them. Yeah. So bad. And, um, and yeah, but he's been really helpful. I'm trying to transition a little bit to tournaments for uh, many reasons because I'm going to be playing online mostly um, except for when I'm in Vegas. And... Like I said, again, touching on the, the the imitation, the private games type thing, it's like cash games are getting tough. Um, they're getting privatized. They're getting mm-hmm. tough. Tournaments are just doing better and better. It's crazy uh, what's been going on with tournaments lately. I was just in Florida. I know you were just in Florida. They were smashing guarantees, and it's a $3,500 buy-in that we played in. And oh, you were there? Awesome. Oh, I was there the in January. Oh, oh okay. It's the exact same tournament. Um, they had a five million. They had five million in the prize pool. I think yours had like seven or eight million in the prize pool. Yeah. Um, but people are playing in these this thirty five hundred dollar buy in tournament, and it feels like the level of competition is maybe like a three hundred and fifty dollar buy in tournament. It's absolutely yeah. insane. So I can see why um, you want to make the switch to tournaments. Plus. Yeah. Um, you're not a real poker player until you notch a few nice entries in your Hendon mob. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I know. When it, a, a fun little anecdote is I did the shooting star Bay 101 and they went around the room and announced like, okay, this is so-and-so. And of course they do like live earnings. And it was like Dan Smith, 8 million, da da da, 8 million. And it was more like 6,000. And they literally like announced it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm getting good at tournaments. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is so embarrassing. 
<laughs> yeah, I, it's it's something that I've always had a love hate relationship with as well. It's nice that you have that luxury with Spraggy, who's focused all of his time on tournaments. So um, I think that obviously you're you're eventually going to have success. It's just inevitable. Um, but I've also caught the tournament bug. So I, I I'll declare it on here. I'm going to have like um, a nice score in the next seven months or so. Some final table, some nice event. I think Marley is as well. So yes. you guys can you guys she can. Uh, what is your current hand and mob? It's like 19 or something. Okay, so now she's she's tripled it since the shooting star. <laughs> <laughs> she's tripled it since the shooting star. Yeah. Basically, since she started since she started playing tournaments. Um, uh, where do we go from here? Um, you uh, you see yourself getting married and having a happily ever life picket fence in in uh, in England. You see yourself coming yeah. back, both of you guys, at some point. Maybe someday. Um, you know, it just kind of makes sense. I mean, frankly, I've, as much as I love Vegas, I've kind of been over it for a while. Um, I love the people, but I just, the city itself is a bit intense. I certainly, like, don't think I'd have a family here just because I've seen, I mean, Nevada is the worst school systems in the country besides Hawaii. Yeah. So I do think it would be an interesting place. Interesting is like a, a nice word for raising a child here. Um, yeah. I don't know if I would want my daughter to go to high school in vegas you know it just seems like not a real life place i mean i said there's obviously private schools and of course you can do it right you can do it first rate but in general you know we want to have kids and stuff like that so and, and england's just so there's like this simplicity to i think europe in general but especially where he lives where this i think that like i spent the last year there in quarantine with him and it really put in perspective how like Americans just live so fast, especially in a place like Vegas, and just the consequences of that, obviously, you know, with relationships, with health, with obesity, whatever, and, and where he lives, it's just like people are just kind of happy with what they have, yeah. and they just seem happier. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, he, he's from like a small place, right? Yeah. But it, it's interesting that how the internet can just connect you to a global scale. You know, he's, yeah. kn he's known everywhere yeah. from the small town in England. Yeah. Uh, it blows my mind every time I send merch to like Korea or Japan or they, I've sent it to Mozambique, Africa. Like I, they, have, oh, yeah? they have internet there. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, so it's just, yeah, it it's blows my mind how YouTube specifically uh, content twitch can connect the whole world together yeah do you you're, you're going to be making a lot more content coming up yeah so i'm starting this new project i've talked about it briefly um i signed with a poker site um deals been done for a long time i just i'm just kind of waiting until i get over there i guess i thought i'd be there by now um but just taking longer and i'm gonna be yeah fully leaning in and doing the kind of content that i think uh Myself and a lot of my fans known have known for a while I should be focusing on. I talked about it earlier, but it is just like so hard to go against the grain and stop doing what the audience says they want. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I made these like seven sketches back in the fall when I was in Dublin, and I'm going to be making more just predominantly just like short comedy sketches, putting them on you know all, all the platforms and and then doing some sort of solo podcast type thing. Uh, just like an out of line yeah, podcast. Yeah, I think that your personality would, and just your ability to, to speak off the cuff and things like that would lend itself well to that Thanks. format. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the content that you put out, looking forward to you uh, peeling a big tournament and you know perhaps 10Xing your Hendon mob. <laughs> wow, yeah, that'd be epic, um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think that uh, we can wrap it up. It's, it's been awesome. about an hour conversation. I really appreciate you taking time with us. You know, the show is basically about everything that I'm interested in. And I've just been really intrigued with the way that you've been able to take your passion of playing poker and turn it into, you know, use another passion that you have, comedy, acting, uh, sketches, just being creative in general and making a career that way as well. So. Uh, I, I've known you for a long time, so I, I can definitely say I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to what the future holds for Marley Sprague. 
Marley's Bragg, yeah, I'm taking his you take, name. You're going to take his yeah. name? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, have you thought? Uh, Miss Spraggy, I don't know. It has a nice ring to it. Miss Spraggy. Well, I want to take Spraggy.tv, so he'll have to get a new, he'll have to get a new channel. Nice, nice. <laughs> well, anyways, thanks again for joining us. And of course. We'll, uh, you guys can see Marley on her YouTube channel. I'll link it everywhere. But if you haven't checked it out, definitely check it out. Thank you guys for joining us on another episode of Embrace the Grind. We'll talk to you later. I'm going to give it all.